When you walk away from someone, their world doesn't end in silence, it ends in static. Inside their brain, something ancient wakes up. A system built long before logic or language. And it begins to scream one message over and over again. You're not safe anymore. Rejection feels emotional, but what actually happens is biological. In the split second, they realize you're serious, that you're really leaving. Their amygdala, the brain's threat detector, explodes into activity. A flood of stress hormones, cortisol, adrenaline, races through their bloodstream. Their heart rate spikes, their breathing changes. This isn't heartbreak, it's a neurological crisis. You see the human brain evolved in tribes. For our ancestors, being excluded meant death, isolation, hunger, danger. So even in the modern world, a breakup feels like being exiled from your own tribe. That's why when you tell them it's over, they don't hear logic, they hear danger. Uh, that danger sets off every alarm their nervous system has. You have seen that blank stare before, the frozen face, the shallow breath. That isn't coldness. It's their system locking up, trying to survive emotional impact. They'll call it heartbreak, but their body calls it threat detection. Hours later, when the initial shock fades, something heavier begins. Their body starts to ache. The chest tightens. The appetite disappears. Sleep becomes a negotiation, and it's not just sadness, it's biology. Brain scans show that emotional pain lights up the same neural circuits as physical pain. The body literally believes it's been injured. That's why heartbreak hurts in the ribs. Not just the mind, that's why their stomach clenches when they see your name. Because to their nervous system, you were safety. And now, safety is gone. Even if they understand it's for the best, their body doesn't care. The body still waits for your voice. The body still expects your presence in the room. Sometimes, the mind accepts faster than the flesh. When you withdraw, their brain scrambles to find equilibrium. And it does what all addicted systems do. It searches for a fix. The reward pathway, the same one activated by dopamine, starts firing patterns of craving, confusion, longing. You became a neurological stimulus. Your messages, your scent, your tone. All of it wired reward associations deep inside them. Now that stimulus is gone, and their brain enters withdrawal. That's why they scroll through old photos. Why they reread your last conversation. Why they stare at last scene on the screen like it means something. They're not weak. They're addicted. Addicted to the chemical balance your presence once provided. And dopamine doesn't want peace. It wants possibility. It wants another hit of hope. So they'll find any sign that means maybe a half-like, a coincidence, a memory. The brain translates all of it into, maybe they still care. Hope becomes their drug, and withdrawal becomes their punishment. When you leave, it's not only the present that reacts, it's every goodbye they've ever endured. In childhood, each of us developed what psychologists call an attachment style, a pattern of how we see closeness and safety. If they grew up with love that was inconsistent, your leaving reawakens the same terror they felt when love once disappeared. If their attachment is anxious, they'll reach out. They'll plead, analyze, over-communicate. Not to control you, but to restore connection. If their attachment is avoidant, they'll shut down. They'll act composed, even cold. But that's their defense against chaos. And some people swing between both. They'll write you a long message at midnight, then block you by morning. It's not game playing. It's nervous system confusion. When you walked away, you didn't just trigger heartbreak. You pressed an old button one wire decades ago and it lit up the entire emotional circuit board of their history. They're not reacting to you. They're reacting to every version of love that ever left them. The psyche has a brilliant way of protecting itself from unbearable truth. It builds mirrors. At first, they'll tell themselves it wasn't real. Then, they'll tell themselves it didn't matter, and eventually they'll tell themselves it's your fault. That's not cruelty. It's survival. Because to admit they were rejected would mean facing their deepest fear. Maybe I'm not enough. So the mind fights back. It reframes you as the problem. It projects. It rationalizes. It rewrites. Every insult, every justification, every you are never right for me is an emotional airbag, cushioning the ego from impact. But underneath, something deeper fractures. The self that once existed through you. You're not just a lover. You were a reflection. 
When you vanish, their sense of identity flickers because part of who they were only existed in your eyes. This is why so many people try to stay friends right away. It's not maturities. It's identity preservation. They're trying to keep at least one version of themselves alive, the version that still meant something to you. Eventually, denial begins to crack. And that's when the mind starts to bargain. It sounds like, if I change, they'll come back. If I give them space, they'll miss me. If I become who they wanted, maybe I'll be enough. This is the stage where logic disappears completely. Because bargaining gives the illusion of control. And the brain would rather have a lie that feels powerful than a truth that feels helpless. They start crafting plans, timelines, spiritual signs. They text you just to check in, hoping for any response that restores a sense of influence. But beneath the hope, there's terror. Because every unanswered message reminds them that their control is gone, and control to the human psyche is the closest thing to safety we know. That's why people often transform dramatically after rejection. New habits, new friends, new goals. It's not always growth. Sometimes it's negotiation. A last attempt to make the pain mean something, because if the pain has meaning, then maybe it's still connected to you. When you reject someone, you don't just leave their heart, you rearrange their entire social universe. Friends choose sides, photos vanish, the plural language disappears, we becomes I, our favorite place becomes, somewhere I can't go anymore. They don't just lose a relationship, they lose their role in the collective story. Social identity theory explains this. We build part of who we are based on the relationships we keep. You weren't just love. You were social proof. Your choice validated their belonging. Now that you're gone, they're left with a haunting question. Who am I when I'm not chosen? That's why rebounds happen so fast. It's not replacement, it's restoration. A way to re-enter the social arena as desirable, as wanted, as someone who still matters. Ironically, this crisis, painful as it is, often becomes the starting point of self-definition because when they can no longer rely on being half of something, they finally begin to meet the whole person inside. Every relationship has a rhythm of power, quiet, invisible, but real. First, you both share it, but the moment you decide to leave, that balance shifts. You now hold something they don't, choice. And their mind feels that imbalance immediately they start scanning for ways to reclaim it, sometimes through control, sometimes through performance, sometimes through silence. They might post something online, hoping you'll see it. They might suddenly go quiet, hoping you'll wonder. They might act like they're already over it, not because they are, but because they need to believe they can be. In psychology, this is called reactance, when the mind resists loss of autonomy by rebelling against it. Their ego whispers, If I can't have you, I'll make you think I don't care. But beneath that performance is grief. Grief dressed as defiance. And as time passes, something else happens. You begin to stabilize. Your emotions settle. You start to see things clearly. Meanwhile, their clarity collapses. Because the one who detaches gains perspective. And the one who's still holding on becomes trapped inside their own resistance. Rejection, though painful, creates growth for both sides, but the one who walks away usually grows first. As days turn to weeks, their brain begins to edit reality. It starts to rewrite the past, not maliciously, not mercifully. You see, the human mind cannot hold constant pain, so it reshapes the story to make it survivable. They begin to remember only fragments. Your laughter, the warmth of your voice, the softness of your shoulder against theirs. The arguments blur, the silences fade, and in their place grows something dangerous. Idealization. They tell themselves, you were perfect, that the love was flawless, that if only one small thing had been different, everything would still be whole. This isn't delusion, it's neurological editing. The hippocampus, responsible for memory, is influenced by emotion. So when emotion changes, memory changes too. They begin to chase not you, but the version of you that their brain has reconstructed. The version that only ever loved them, the version that never left. Sometimes they'll even reach out, not because they want to restart, but because they can't stand not knowing if the story still matters. They aren't addicted to you anymore. They're addicted to the narrative, the one where they were still chosen. Eventually, 
Every nervous system tires. The adrenaline, the denial, the anger. They burn themselves out, and in that quiet exhaustion, something sacred begins. One morning, they'll wake up and notice something different. The air feels lighter. Your name drifts through their mind like a memory, not a wound. It's not that they stopped caring, it's that their nervous system finally accepted reality. The pain no longer signals danger, it signals growth. Neural pathways start to rebuild. The absence of you is no longer a threat. It becomes space. Space for new habits, space for solitude, space for identity. And slowly, they begin to understand your leaving was not cruelty, it was permission. Permission to face the parts of themselves they could never see when you were still there. Because love has a strange way of hiding us from ourselves. When it's gone, we meet the person beneath the dependency. And that's the hardest, most sacred meeting of all. Eventually, they'll talk about you with peace in their voice. Not because they've forgotten, but because they've integrated. You became a chapter in their becoming, a necessary catalyst in their evolution. And perhaps one day, they'll look back and whisper, Thank you for walking away when I couldn't let go. Because the truth is, rejection doesn't destroy love. It transforms it from possession into understanding, from dependence into growth, from us into me. And maybe that was the point all along. If you've ever been the one who walked away or the one left behind, remember, both roles carry pain and both hold transformation. You're not broken for feeling deeply, you're human for doing so. And if this reflection helped you understand the hidden language of the mind, leave a like, share this story with someone who needs it, and stay curious about the beautiful, complicated science of being human.